everybody, we are back again with Brian. I'm so sorry, I have a little problem. Okay, I'm hearing a weird sound. Okay, Oof, sorry, uh, sorry about that, everybody. I have a little problem. It should be great now. Um, so we've ba we are back with Brian. And so Brian, you wanted to show us a little more about your work. Yeah, um, I just thought I'd show like some of the work that went into the. Um the sprites in the game. So you can see with this unit here, it's roughly around 400 frames, 384, I think, mm -hmm. with the final. And for every enemy, I more or less drew new smoke effects on them, which was, uh, sorry, one second, kind of a huge pain and kind of manually drawing different frames for the base effects. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought that might be fun just to show some of those. Um, mm -hmm. If anyone has any questions or whatnot though i'm happy to do that instead but well i have one for you um sure. <laughs> the first one um so we are talking about pixel art but why photoshop to do pixel art is it is it a little odd because you don't you think you have a better um other uh, thing you could have used who would have I, been maybe better well this is the the odd thing is like it's better if you're faster in it mm. and i'm i'm probably this is like I'm one of the fastest artists that I know on these things. So despite using Photoshop, it would be slower for me to know and learn a new tool right now, mm -hmm. despite the fact that that tool might be better at specific things. Mm. So like there are a lot of weird things with Photoshop's animation, but I'm used to them. So uh, like I know of most of the other ones and I've dabbled with them, but I'm, I'm not faster with those than I am with Photoshop. I see. So that's, that's a me thing. Like, Per, mm -hmm. If you if you're starting, if you haven't been doing this for like 20 years already, and you're you're used to well, you're not used to Photoshop or whatnot. I guarantee things like uh, what are the the big ones I've seen? I've used most of them at um, some point in time. Oh shoot, I have a <laughs> trouble uh, reminding. Um... Yeah, no, I know I know most of them. I'm just trying. I can't think of the names of them off the top of my head. Like we do use some of them for like um, we use. There's one we use to generate all the color palettes. Asprite. Uh, Asprite is my Asprite. favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Asprite. Yeah. Asprite. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We use that one uh, for some things. I have drawn some in Asprite or Asprite. Hmm. I don't know how you say it. A E S Sprite. No, no. Uh, Asprite. But... I pronounce it in French. In French. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. It's fine either way. I don't. I don't know how it's pronounced, but I've never heard it spoken. I've only seen the program, right? So hmm. yeah, there's that one. There's a couple other ones we do use um, Asprite for specifically for our color palettes and things. Oh I yeah. Just didn't... I didn't use it for the animations because I'm just used to, I do all the like part separation and rotation and then redrawing on a frame by frame basis in Photoshop and I'm used mm -hmm. to it and I'm fast at it, so. And uh, in the same um, same uh, category, like um, about the ethics, you know, about the flame, why draw everything by hands? Uh, wouldn't have it more easy to work on, uh, I don't know, particles maybe? We particles? do some we reinforce things with particles and okay. there's like individual particles that I've like made and Matt, uh, the, the one that did all the effects and timeline animation in Star Renegades, uh, does that, I can actually show kind of the mix of that if, if I can get unity to agree with us. <laughs> so, um, cause that's just loading instead of using, uh, Wamba, sorry, uh, Badger, we use cattle for that. And that's our timeline animation where we can spawn when particles generate and when, Things. So there are some things that are just particles that come up. There are some things, the bigger effects. We actually did samples. We did samples with 3D effects. We did samples with rendered effects. And mm -hmm. for our game, they took us out of the aesthetic mm. where they can do, they do them and they do them well in uh, Octopath and stuff. But we just found because our characters were so heavily animated, if you had the attack animations kind of done in the same vein, it, it made things look more cohesive. So and it's definitely, I wouldn't say it's a universal truth, but that's something that we found for our game is that when we tried those other things, they didn't fit in as well. Um, so if the timeline editor, oh, uh, combat animation editor, if I load this, then I can show kind of how those things are assembled. Uh, I'm not gonna take credit for the timeline setups themselves because that was all done by Matt. Um, did a great job with that. So I did all of the pixel animation and I would visualize that and then Matt would take it and pull it into Unity and assemble it all in timelines and stuff. 
um, by that time, uh, Damien Mayans have a question. Um, sure. How did you pack the huge sprite sheet in Unity and how do you load them? Asset bundle, oh. maybe? Uh, yeah, well, we used, I, I know the funny thing is we didn't end up using sprite atlases because of the nature we tried. And we did use uh, texture packer and typical kind of tools like that to do it at first. But um, because we were doing, um, I'm trying to remember what it was specifically, we we use addressables and we do a couple of things in more of the programming side that I'm not fully aware of. And that was kind of on their thing. But uh, we, when we were trying to do it with texture atlases, it was causing uh, too much issues because we were we had one level that was breaking, the elevator level in the game was breaking because one of the assets was larger than a texture app, which was allowed to be. And things like that. And it's kind of one of the weird issues with doing super high frame rate, uh, super big sprites and things like that in pixel art. Hmm. If we would have done a more, you know, NES, super NES, building everything out of tiles, uh, it would have helped with some of that probably, but you get a different look. Our game was kind of, uh like almost more like a, a jrpg dreamscape mm. uh so this is our combat timeline animator so what you can do with this is you can load any unit so we could load a hero it's a fun one still be ages uh so we can load whatever unit and then we can load any enemy this is a custom tool that we built and then you can test any of your um, animation. So when we pull a boss in here, it's a fun one. Demon like? Sure. Um, and this, we, we can cycle their position on either side to make sure that the animation doesn't break when it goes from one to the other. And if it's an AOE, we can generate a party or we can switch sides and see if the animation breaks on the other side. And we can also change whatever level, um, what's the level? Change level. We can change to any of the other levels in the game. Let's grab No. Sorry. How's that one? Oops. I'm looking for the giant hand. Where is the hand? One more. Let's get one more try for this. Ah, Dagger Bridge. That's it. So we got this background in place. And then we can load any power animation. So let's load the Aegis. So it should be H page. And then uh, effects, sorry, effects, uh, powers. So from this, we can load any any of the animations in the game. So let's do heavy bash, and then we need to open the timeline. This timeline, oh, timeline's here, and we can play it. So you can play your animation. Oh, sorry. So you can see the animation plays. It will be slow the first time, and then it'll be fast afterwards. Mm. So rewind, and then we can play. So it's a combination. You see little particles come off of things, but we can tune our animation. Uh, as we switch to interstitial view, you'll see the more close-up view of these. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's um, Matt would take whatever sprite work that I had done, and he would set it up. I can also show from, this is actually running better than the background editor right now. But you can see all of the different planes that I set up to create an illusion. So I've kind mm -hmm. of boxed in. Some things are rotated at different angles to try to give the illusion of specific views. And then I have a reflective water layer underneath, a planar, mm. with a, a planar reflection with a water shader. Um, yeah, sorry. So this is kind of some of what goes into the animation. We do a mix of, um, we do a mix of uh, big hand-drawn effects with particles to reinforce them. Hmm, I see. And um, so you said you had to do ev almost every asset yourself, and uh, it was a lot of work. Um, yeah. Can I ask how much uh, time did you work a day? Like, it really seemed like a, a, a very big task for one man alone. 
I, I don't know. I, I didn't work overtime very much. Okay. Like I was pretty good at working. I mean, I have three kids as well. Hmm. So usually at five o'clock is my cutoff. I'm not going to lie. There were a few windows due to deadlines where I was working 12 or 16 hour days, but they would usually last upwards of like three weeks to a month and then they would be over. Um, and my work didn't, so we did a, uh, an assessment and we've done a no crunch thing. And if you don't, you're not required at any point in time to do crunch. So, okay. but you know, there are definitely times like sometimes it's, it's not work, it's other people. Like, uh, for instance, Microsoft came to us and they were offering us booth space for GDC and their booth for free. If we did this set of assets or whatnot for them in, in like two days. Oh, so I, oh I had to like, I had to kill myself trying to get Unity crashed again. I had to oh. kill myself crash um, to get those assets done in time mm. for their booth. But how do you turn down Microsoft, right? Yeah, it's of course. Like, it's one of these things. There's a kind of funny thing too, where we had made a deal with, uh, through Off Fury for, um, it was uh, last year during E3, right? They There was an indie event and Raw Fury had done like, first viewing permission with um i can't remember what the thing was it was the the indie showcase that we were part of and uh for the video they were supposed to have the first show of it and then sony on their playstation channel dropped our trailer two hours before the conference oh <laughs> And it was like, oh my gosh, well, how do you say no to PlayStation doing that on their PlayStation channel, right? At the same time as, uh, uh, you know what I mean? It's just like, sometimes there's there's things that blindside you and you have no ability, right? It's like when Microsoft or Sony or Nintendo make their moves, you're kind of at their whim. But yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't usually, like it was a lot of work to animate everything in the game. There's like, I don't know how many characters or enemies there are, probably... I, I don't know. I did hundreds and hundreds of frames of animation. Actually, sorry, did I turn my screen share off? If I turn it back on again, it's mm -hmm. like one of the things I was going to say on the slide at the end was animate everything. So mm -hmm. it was like every little thing in the game, I essentially animated just to bring life. So every tree I did uh, animation set. We actually built our own custom wind system for the game. Okay. So it would sweep from the top left corner of the screen across to the bottom right, and it would activate all of them kind of in a pattern so that you get that wind effect as it mm. goes across, um, things like that. Okay. Any, any other questions or thoughts? Uh, not from the chat, but I have a lot to ask. Yeah, yeah, go for um, it. Okay, so um, uh, did, do you think it would have been um, a little more easy on some aspect to have used uh, 3D models and use a 2D texture? Or is it really uh, faster and easier only with planes and 2D texture? Uh, it's probably, I don't know about faster, but I think they'd be pretty equivalent because when you do 3D, obviously you need to, to UV unwrap and you need mm. to... Uh, texture and then uh, 3D is so versus cutting the pixel art it just wouldn't have suited our aesthetic as well I feel mm -hmm. and maybe that was just me pushing for that because that's how I work best and I was kind of imagining something something a little bit akin to like Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door in terms of how it's set up and how it holds such a tight illusion from a very specific angle but it would break if you had camera control and um, I don't know, I, I had, a, I guess for this game specifically, it's like we're working in 3D in the game that's unannounced right now. So I'm pretty familiar with what is going on with that pipeline and stuff, but it's not, um, it's not what I thought would have suited Star Renegade specifically. Mm -hmm. I guess yeah. I just had something really specific in my mind. And the fact that we've done all of the assets 2D to begin with, it was more about keeping the essence of assets that were already getting really, really positive responses online, especially with the backgrounds, people were having a really positive response. And I don't know if we could have modeled it in 3D and had it look exactly the same, Yeah, I especially especially as a model wraps on like the sides of the, like with the big Titan thing on the sides of the face, those pixels would start to wrap around the outside of a mesh and you would kind of lose some of the aesthetic quality. Mm -hmm. Uh, Damien Mayans is asking if it's possible uh, to see how the lighting is done in Unity. <laughs> but, yeah, uh... I will. 
you know what? Let's put a five minute pause on that question as I reboot yeah. Unity. And if it reboots, <laughs> then I will happily show you the lighting. Yeah, well, um, in that time, um, so you explain why you decide to have a lot of pink, and I agree it's, it's uh, give a unity in the game, in the direction, art, in the art direction of the game, and it's really beautiful, but why pink specifically? <laughs> Do you have an, any idea why pink? I was inspired by pink. It was when we okay. started Star Renegades. I think it was just... I have this thing of like my kids and stuff because people ask me my favorite color and it always drives them crazy because I'll answer like rainbow or every color has its context mm -hmm. because it's like there's no favorite color is how a color is used right mm -hmm. and that it's like all about color harmonies and things. anyone who does uh, any basic art theory knows you know you got complementary split complementary all of these things um there's a lot of analogous color schemes in star renegades because it creates like a harmonious feel um a lot of classic games used complementary to make things pop, right? Uh, there's there's lots of things that go into color. When it came to pink, I just really wanted a unifying thing. And at that time, it was like, what, 2016, 2017, everything was brown and post-apocalyptic. Yeah. And, you know, I really just wanted to pick a color to offset that. I don't know. I could have gone blue. I could have gone anything. But... Yeah, because I, I was wondering, because uh, in science, science fiction, we are more used to see blue colors or gray. And uh, it's, it's really refreshing to see pink in a sci-fi game, you know? Well, we did a we did the blue versus pink was yeah. kind of what we did. So if you look at the here, if we pull in all characters. So the character sheets. Sorry, I see if this loads this Photoshop, so it should be okay. Hmm. Um, almost all of the highlight colors on the Rebels is the blue. Yeah, that's true. The, and then, but it's overwhelming because the highlight colors on the, where's the Imperium? Um, it's, it's an older version of that folder. Mm, great. It's in the slide deck. But uh, if you look at the entire set of the Imperium, they all have the, the pink. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, and that was kind of what I ended up going with. So it was kind of the clash of the two colors, the yeah. big evil, the big evil pink highlights versus the blue highlights. I don't know why it could have been the other way around. It just ended up suiting the look of our game. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was, I thought it was kind of interesting to be like, have these giant units with these pink highlights. And yeah, it's some, great. Some fun in that. Um, yeah. Anyways, yeah. Any uh, any any other thoughts while Unity is loading? Uh, no. Yeah, Unity is still running. Um... Yeah, yeah. So while <laughs> it's loading, I'll uh, I'll show the lights. I'll pause the scenes. There's less of a chance of crashing. Mm. But... Um. So you you told us that you you did all your concept art directly in pixel art, and um. Well, I did uh, concept art pixel art first. So I did yeah, all the pixel art first. Yeah. Yeah, so it was like the character, right? So characters have, first of all, they have like their little map state, they have their full size, and they have their uh, their portraits. And the small, these ones were what I did first. And we mm. would approve these little guys first because it gives you if, you, if you're getting a sense of personality or whatnot in that level of simplification, then it's easier to extrapolate that going forward. If you're losing that when it's simple, how are you going to, you know, it's kind of one of these weird things. We want to add it at the the lowest level so you can see, oh, who is this person? What is what's interesting about them? And then from there, um, develop all the rest. Yeah. So you you can just start by the most difficult aspect, and uh, after that, it was more easy to to create a story for them. Yeah, it's kind of you like whatever forearm guns or like. Lots of different things trying to draw inspiration from all over the place. This is the funniest one, this little person, because it's in tons of the art, but it's not actually in the game. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, uh, where is it? If I just pull up. One second. Um, I did a, a Chrono Trigger, um, a Chrono Trigger uh, homage image. I'll see if I can pull it up in a second. Mm but that involves that character as well but it's yeah I, I, I like typically I would draw the character in pixel art and whatnot and then when I go off and go about my day sometimes I pull my sketchbook and I would just sketch other versions of them and whatnot and kind of extrapolate it from there mm. yeah unity still loading 
<laughs> God. You can see that the green in the bottom as it fills up. Yeah, uh, concept art was obviously a different beast. Um, some of the what was I saying? What's going on? Okay, some of the like looser uh, concepts. I, I email myself pictures sometimes so that I have <laughs> access to them. Um, but like the base concepts and stuff, they all came after the fact. Um, so I did them after. So that's Win Cyfax, which is kind of like the primary character in our game. Um, let's just find the Chrono Renegades one and I'll show that. I think probably my biggest inspirations were like Chrono Trigger and Metroid. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, you told us yeah, that you yeah. loved Metroid, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I remember uh, you said that um, uh, there was a, a picture you did who got really famous. Uh, you know, the, the background with the giant. And yeah, the... the Crying Titan. It was yeah. number one on pixel art. It's kind of funny because it was posted on Reddit pixel art as number one, which is yeah. funny. I did a, I did a viral... Lisa Sue gift from AMD, and that was number one at Wall Street Bets. And I was okay. like, on on, but it's weird when people take your work and then they they put it all over the place, and it's like it's more famous than I am in some ways on Twitter and all of these things. But um, yeah, it's kind of funny because people were referencing Hyperlight Drifter for it. Mm -hmm. People thought it was Hyperlight Drifter fan art, and I was like, I hadn't even played Hyperlight Drifter at that point. I have played it since. Mm. I was trying to combine like a Sentinel from X Men with um, like the Iron Giant and a couple of other things. Oh, and I okay. think if you look at them, there's a significant of differences, but it's like, I guess they followed a similar reference path to end up on the same thing. Cause I hadn't seen much on Hyperlight Drifter until after that. And I was like, I gotta play this Hyperlight Drifter game. Yeah. And then <laughs> I played it, it's a great game. Um, yeah, it's yeah. true. And Hyperlight Drifter, if I remember correctly, also use a lot of pink or a lot of very um, saturated yeah. colors. So there's maybe that's why, yeah. There's a lot of games that did that too around that era. Mm. I think that um, it, it was a big thing in pixel art at that time to do fully 2D pixel art, but do gradient washes of either like blue or pink or other colors. So it was a trend in pixel art at the time. Mm. And uh, you told us that um, the fact that uh, your, your picture getting famous <laughs> make you almost anxious? Like, well, it's... Uh... it's it's kind of interesting. I can elaborate on that. You keep, keep your question. I'll pull something up. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. Do you have anything else to say on that? Sorry, I cut you off. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> review my notes, uh, but I have asked you almost everything I wanted to know. Uh, oh, no, a uh, last one. Um, you, you show us um, like a, a pilot about, you know, um, what uh, Star Renegade was at, um, was supposed to be first, like uh, yeah, something yeah. with motorcycles and size fives. And uh, you told us that you were um, sad because you had something that was uh, working on Unity and, and such. Do you think uh, that project could uh, come back to life in another form uh, sometimes? Uh, probably. We talked about that. It would have to come back to life as, um, come back to life not with that combat system. The bike mm. building component was very interesting and it worked very well. So there's something to your ability to build motorcycles and stuff like that. However, the um, the aspect of it that was um, like hex-based combat and stuff wasn't working that well. So we probably ditched that and tried doing a different gameplay method with the bike building mechanics. Mm, I see. So um, in a way, I, do you think like you're more, um, do you like more sci sci science fiction or erotic fantasy or do, don't you have anything you prefer? Everything works for you, artistically speaking? Well, I mean, I'm an artist, so yeah, I do whatever people tell me to do for the most part, right? Yeah. It's like, I'm not the one coming up with the game pitches. I have to skin it. I have to skin the concept or, or whatever it is. So I don't have any personal preference one way or the okay. other. Um, fantasy, sci-fi, whatever. Um, all of it can be interesting to me. It's more like, how do I fit whatever game we're trying to push? Now, Massive Damage, the studio I work for, they have a history of doing sci-fi games. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that puts me in a lot of sci-fi spaces. Um, it's kind of interesting. John Linneman from Digital Foundry in relationship to your last question. 
I did mm. this like silly pixel art for for him. He was feeling depressed about um, he's feeling depressed about uh, like and I noticed people attacking him on Twitter and whatnot because it's like for anyone who knows Digital Foundry, it's like the go-to source for technical breakdowns of games and stuff. Mm. And they're like, well, you know, you're famous for this. Why are you depressed? And I'm like. I think it's kind of interesting because it's like a misassociation. It's like people assume that success brings um, some level of, how do I word this? Sorry. People assume that, well, no, that you're going to be, you know, more confident or feel better. And like, and I don't know if that that's true. You're more exposed, if anything. And the more exposed you are, whether it's your work that's exposed or whether it's you, I mean, anyone who's an artist here in this talk, I don't know how many people are watching or whatnot right now, but it, I'm sure you have that moment where someone takes your sketchbook, right? Or whatnot, and you're like here and you're trying to be okay, but you're secretly hovering through the person looking through your sketchbook because so much of you is exposed, mm -hmm. right? It's like, if they really wanted to look into it, they could probably uncover so much about you through looking at your sketchbook or thinking about what it is that you're interested in or what you're prioritizing or, things like that. Um, but the, uh, like, it's, it's not necessarily the case that success doesn't necessarily bring that. And it's like the moderate amount of success I've had. So at first there's like imposter syndrome because the first images that I did that did it better. And I'm like, can I do this again? Mm. Right. Is it possible for me to even produce this again? And then it's like, is this just the best thing I'll ever do? And did I stumble upon it? And am I going to fail when I do that again? Fortunately, it's like I've done like, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 things that have gone fairly viral now. And then it's like, okay, your anxiety drops a little bit because you're like, not everything I do is going to land, but maybe every five or six things I do will land. And then you have a little bit more, but it, it's at the same time, it's like you're exposing yourself. People are interacting with things in ways you don't know. I didn't know they were going to take my silly amd gif someone rips it off of here i can show it and put it on wall street bets reddit and not credit me and then it's Aww. the number one post on wall street bets it's like i don't know when that's going to happen right you have no control over these things you put your work out there you try to do your best on it sometimes it hits the mark and people really respond to it sometimes it doesn't some artists are ridiculously consistent at that and I'm getting more consistent, but I don't know if, but it, it is nerve wracking, right? It's one of these, these things. Yeah, I understand. Uh, I remember at the end of um, Star Renegade, uh, you, all, you also uh, did uh, portraits for everyone on the team in pixel art. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah That's fun. Okay, uh, why, why is that? Like it wasn't necessary. Uh, why did you guys did that? It was it just for fun or did you want to really show them? As characters. Uh, it was actually for Christmas presents oh. for the team. So that was more in response to, uh, they gave me a little bit of time just in my work period. They're like, yeah, why don't you, because I, I did them for Halcyon 6 for half of the team because the other artists had done them for the other half of the team. And I, so I finished the, yeah, the ones for Halcyon 6. And then um, when it was Star Renegades, it, we were still getting Halcyon 6 gifts. So it was like prints and stuff at Christmas time. Uh, Linda would go off and make gift sets for people. It'd be like towels and things. And I was still using the Halcyon 6 art. And I was like, oh man, I got to get some Star Renegade stuff. So I redid all of the staff portraits. And then I did the little versions of them for combat, which were kind of fun <laughs> and so on and so forth. You know, you kind of just make um, make things. And uh, and yeah, so, and then we were like, well, we're already made. Let's stick them in the game so we can talk yeah. to us. Okay. End, which is kind of funny. Yeah, it was. Um, you also did uh, a little corgi in the game. Um, yes. Same question. Why you corgi? Is there any reason or? Well, I think that like all of the corgi stuff goes back to Cowboy Bebop. Ah, because <laughs> in see. Cowboy Bebop, you have um, Ayn, right? Which is the mm. name of the corgi. Now, one of my best friends, Evan, who's another artist, he has a corgi and he named it Ayn. And it was just... We thought it was funny so <laughs> and ken was uh, begging us to to do it and we did it for um we did it for uh can you hit the and we did it and then it ended up being posted by uh can you pet the dog in on 
Twitter. So it was one of these kind of like cross things. Uh, this is the, the AMD post that I did Yay. that was taken and put on top of uh, Wall Street Bats. So I did that for level one tech on YouTube. But um, yeah, it's just kind of funny. You just do something <laughs> and then people take it and do whatever the heck they want with it, right? Mm. Um, also, another weird one was I just recently did a, a GIF in my spare time for Near Replicant. Mm. um and that was reposted by square enix itself which oh, was kind of funny right yeah yeah but it's just like it's kind of a weird thing when you do something and just people take it interact with you and it's out of your hands right mm -hmm. some people hate it some people love it you hope more of them love it i found that my personal threshold for tolerance is like 95 percent positive <laughs> if it goes if it goes beyond that then i start feeling like a failure it's a weird thing i think this is kind of like a, a typical thing artists will feel when they mm. put their work out there if it's like as soon as it crosses that 80 to 20 percent positive versus negative line even if it's 80 percent positive you start feeling really terrible about yeah. it yeah but when it's as long as it's above that then you're like okay i feel okay about this piece <laughs> and um, I, was, I was happy that sorry go ahead no no uh don't worry um damien mayans again <laughs> don't worry damien um, ask me this question. So I work with pixel artists on pixel art games, so I can have a lot of questions. Do you think you will switch to as a sprite, or do you have a lot of Photoshop script plugin? Um, I, I just, it's just speed for me. I'm just so fast with Photoshop that there's no point in switching to a sprite. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know, our game has I don't even know how many enemies and characters at however many. Most of the characters have between 300 and 500 frames. And I can do a character set usually in a day or two. And a boss is like uh, maybe, you know, three days to a week. So it's like with that ability and that speed, it would slow me down so much to learn a new program, even if it was better. Mm -hmm. And I'm used to all of Photoshop shenanigans. So, and that's from when I, my first got out of art school, I ended up getting a job at a, a small indie studio that was doing phone games. So I, at that point in time, Ace Bright and stuff didn't exist. So I was just... I got really, and we weren't doing pixel art, but because the iPhone, the first generation iPhone resolution was so small, everything was basically pixel art anyways, mm. even though you weren't doing it that way. And I just got so used to it. So I'm like, I could learn it. Um, I'm sure there's benefits. I'm sure there's also downsides. Uh, I don't think there's a universal program that kind of is better at everything. Usually there's some aspects you're like, why doesn't it have this? It's like, for instance, I'm using a lot of, um, for more of my uh, painted work, I've been using a lot of switching back and forth between Photoshop and um, Clip Paint Studio. And Clip Paint is way better when it comes to line work and things like that. And, but then you come and it's like even cropping and some of the hotkeys and certain behaviors and it just aren't anywhere near as good as Photoshop. So it's like, I'm constantly saving things as a PSD and switching it between the programs to take advantage of both sets of benefits. Um, and I think everything kind of has those issues. Uh, I think I'm in Unity. Sorry, someone wanted me to show the lights. Yep, yep, it's the same, per it's the same person. Actually. Same person. So let's, is there a specific scene you'd be more likely to see? Maybe we can pick the train or something because it has so many lights involved in it. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm curious okay. about this one too, yeah. So uh, we have a couple of things going on. We have faked volumetrics and we have real volumetrics. So one of the things I asked for, uh, let me get out, I guess sorry, I just gotta wait till it loads a bit. So it's slow at the beginning. Okay, so I have my scene view here. Let's hope nothing crashes. Okay, so we have our faked light planes. So for me, these are like individual textures that they're just, flat textures and they're fake volumetric lights, but we have real volumetric lights as well. So this one here, you can see it in the background, that's gonna pass into the scene at certain points in time. So if we scroll, where's our lights? So this is a volumetric light right here and it passes by. So we have true volumetric lights that we can adjust our volume settings on. We have unique volume lights. And then we also have a complete, so in this, this little, sure, oh, I lost my scene. Double click on something to straighten myself out. Okay, so let's summon our characters into the scene. So run your placeholder units. Oh, I meant to unpause it for that. Um, I can pause it for a second so that I don't miss crashing. Okay, so we have our placeholder units in the scene. Um, pause this. And then we'll 
mode. Okay. So we have our placeholder units in the scene, um, and we have all of these lights that can affect them. So I have a blue spotlight that passes over the scene um, right here, and I've just set it to scroll across. We have a base light just to create. So this is our player spotlight, and we have this just a spot right here. Um, so we kind of use a mix of you know spots, points, volumetric lights, and stuff. On big mistake that we did for our game is we didn't bake any lighting. Oh, and it let, us, okay. it let us do time of day settings. It let us do um, a bunch of things, but the performance cost was extremely high. So like, it's kind of interesting because we've had, we've had people be like, especially on the switch board and stuff like, it's a pixel art game. Why does it run terribly? It's like, first of all, our game is huge from a sprite perspective. The sprite load is like most pixel art games don't have, you know, how many is this? Six, 12 sprites on the screen with four, 400 to 500 frames of animation each. Some of them are absolutely massive. On top of that, each of those frames and each of the settings are being lit dynamically by lights, um, which performance costs can be pretty high. So it's kind of deceptively, de deceptively heavy of a game. Um, and if we would have baked our lights, we would have lost, because a lot of our lighting effects and whatnot at combat, you get really cool shadows that kind of dance off the players when they get hit and stuff. And if we would have went uh, baked, we would have lost that ability. So there's some cool stuff that you get. And it runs great on PC. But uh, and actually, Xbox is the next best. But um, the, the, the Switch and the P, um, PS4 ports both took a bit of a hit in regards to we just had our, our draw calls and our, our lighting was intense. Our, world, our maps. So when you look at all the trees and stuff, our planet maps, they can really tank performance because there's literally thousands of objects being cast with dynamic lights at all mm. points in time. And each tile is a, we, we did the best we could to optimize, um, spent like literally seven or eight months optimizing. And even still, we had to make some serious visual compromises on some platforms. Yeah, so um, we suppose the Switch port team probably had a very good time. Yeah, they... <laughs> Uh, yeah, some decisions, especially decisions I probably made, um, they probably weren't the best for getting it to run on lots of hardware, but I was trying to make a game look a very specific way. And that was, that was maybe, I should have, in hindsight, I would definitely have baked lights. It would have had some visual downsides, but it would have improved performance. But um, some scenes, if I load a different background, let's just unpause and load some of those for a second. Uh, I'll actually close and restart it. Um, any other questions to fill the time while I... Uh, no, actually, uh, we... <laughs> Nobody seems to have a lot of questions except Damien. Thank you very much for yes. everything you asked. Right. Um, but um, I was wondering um, if you have any project, personal project uh, right now, or are you only focusing your time on your work? Oh, uh, I always have, like people usually contact me to have some freelance things on the go. Mm -hmm. So I almost always usually have some freelance things. And if anything comes by and it, it pays well enough to be, and it sounds fun, then I typically do it. Um, like, I don't know, I've, I've done a bunch of work with just like YouTubers and other stuff just for fun. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have game ideas that I'd love to do myself, but I don't know if I'll ever do them. So, mm -hmm. and every time, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you, you. No, I don't even know what I was going to say anymore. Um, I was wondering if um, what would be your dream project, the the project you would dream to work on. I have several. It's like I love games so much. I've grown up absolutely adoring games, and I would love to make like a Mega Man like game or a Metroid game at some point in time. I'd love to make like a really deep story based game, like I don't know, like Final Fantasy VI or Chrono Trigger or something like that. I would absolutely love to do something like that or you know, even a platformer. Or I, I speed run Mega Man games in my spare time usually, so I can beat most of them in under an hour. So I'd always be down for trying to make one of those. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, so you, you said you were working on some new project who this time will be in 3D. And yeah. uh, do you think you prefer to work on pixel art on, or on 3D? I think this kind of comes back to the conversation I had on the plane with the mm. rock star artist. It's what suits the idea, mm -hmm. right? It's like, 
because I mean, all of these things, it's about generating feelings or evoking specific reactions from people. What are we trying to evoke? What's gonna reinforce whatever the game is, right? So it's like, uh, I, I play all types of games. I have a, you know, a soft spot in my heart for pixel art games. I have a soft spot for even like crude 3D games. Or um, I think the, the big problem with 3D is, um, well, it's not a, a problem per se, but like, well, it hasn't aged as well. Like mm. 3D doesn't, and part of it's just because, you know, bad 3D ages worse than bad 2D or, and good 3D still ages worse than good 2D. And that's like, you can pop in whatever Odin Sphere, or you can pop in, and some of those games, it's like, why on GameCube or Xbox PS2 generation is Wind Waker still one of the best looking games? It's because they created an art style that kind of went around the problem. Whereas I remember at the time that Metroid Prime came out, it was such a crazy good looking game. And everyone was freaking out about Splinter Cell, the original Splinter Cell, because it came out around the same time and it had dynamic lighting and all of these things. If you play Metroid Prime now, it's still gorgeous. If you play Splinter Cell now, it's hideous beyond <laughs> all. So some of this is art direction. Some of this is, you know, it's like in terms of how well things will age or whatnot. But um, I think that like, it's really about thinking about the idea of the game and pitching in an aesthetic that matches it, right? It's like, if you can create that harmony perfectly where you have a visual aesthetic that matches the game, regardless of what the game is, then you are, um, you're really, that, that's what resonates with gamers, I think more than anything else. So mm -hmm. it's like finding what's place. It's like, if you're working on, and like, what type of game are you, are you making, right? If you're making a game that adheres to classics, then maybe it should have more of a classic approach if it, has a more uh, modern style, maybe you should have more of a modern approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, if anyone in the chat, for example, wanted to start uh, pixel art, do you have any tips for them? Um, I mean, typical things, limit your colors. You, you have more forgiveness horizontally with pixel art than you do vertically. So when you're drawing lines, if you, when you're drawing up, people are more offended by weird jumps when they're going up or down than if they're going side to side. So that's uh, an interesting point. I mean, pixel art's all about limiting your colors effectively for the most part. If you do really nice in picking, are you doing two, two values per area? Like does the shirt have two colors or does it have three, right? Um, and you can do good aesthetics with any of those things. So, I mean, part of it's messing around, part of it's simplification. I think like Christoph Niemann, and the Netflix documentary Abstract said it pretty good when you, he was simplified a bus, bus to like three Lego blocks, I think, in that. And there was something really interesting to see where you're like, this you can capture the essence of things really simply. And pixel art, it's about that. So sometimes the more complex you go, the worse off it is. And it would have been better to do something more simple for that. And that's a, a hard approach. Or just like pick a canvas size and play with it. Set like 100 by 100 pixels or set you know, 250 by whatever, and just play on that canvas and see what you create. Hmm. And uh, you told us at first that you prefer to work uh, uh, on characters most, um, most... More than backgrounds. Yes, yes. And um, what, uh, did, is there anything who helped you uh, doing background or um, did you just oh, had to force yourself to finally enjoy it? Yeah, it's not that I don't enjoy it. It's that if I do, if I have someone else to do something, like, and I have the ability to leverage that work off somewhere else, I'll usually just say, you do the backgrounds, <laughs> right? It's just like this nature that I guess I've, I've had that history. And because Star Renegades was mostly me for 90, like for me in regards to pixel art, um, for 95, I had to do kind of everything. And I kind of wanted to push myself and I'm fine with it not being that way in future games. I think this game was just me testing myself. And it's specifically because when I worked at three other studios beforehand, I was always working under someone else. So I had to match their style and I had to go. So I didn't know at that point in time whether I could do a game by myself that people would respond to. So I just wanted to see if I could do it once, if I could do a game that was mostly me. And and people like it or whatnot. And it's nerve wracking because you don't know what people don't like it. Then they, it's personal, it's more personal. It's like, they don't like you, right? 
I mean, fortunately, I'd say that the, the response to the visuals of the game have been incredibly positive. So, uh, and, you know, I was so anxious going into the first shows that we did when we did Gamescom and things like that. I was really anxious that people wouldn't like the work when they played it the first time, but when people were stopping to look constantly, you know, I felt a heck of a lot better. Hmm. Um, it's a good background. Let's do bush fields, get some grass blowing on. Um, focus on here. I can kind of break down the lighting because I have Unity up and running for a second. Okay, so we have the scene, we have our lights, and I can kind of take our whole pipeline into account here. Um, so we have uh, in our lights, we have background, foreground, where is it? We also have the ability to change our scene to a nighttime scene for campfires. Oh. So you'll see you have a daylight group and you have a nighttime group. So if we, we can, you can turn it off and you can switch between the two modes. So if you in the inspector, you turn off day, you can turn on night and then you get kind of different appearances. There's more to do than that, but um, each of our scenes have day and night for camp specifically. Um, in our, where's our lights? Let me find the lights real quick. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You don't look in these files for a while, and then you lose track of everything. Yeah. Daytime lights. Daylight. I of course it's at the top. Um, so, so you see, you got our basic world light, which just creates your your primary light scene. We have, uh, and I do this a little bit differently for each one. We did set a custom light for shadows, um, just so we had a little bit more control of them. Let's see, let's generate some characters in the scene. Um, place where needs. So the one light generating those shadows, you can see that the player shadows and the grass shadows are attached to that light specifically. Um, the background, I usually have a separate background light just so I can tune things to the levels that I want because it's really hard to get the world light to light everything consistently off of with this specific thing. It's easier to do on a fully 3D game. Um, and then volumetric lights just to kind of fill the air. So we have, we're using, uh, I don't know whether it's a plugin or whether it's a base Unity asset, but we can, you know, do a noise texture and um, determine how much 3D noise or stuff is in that volumetric light. And then we have a player spotlight and an enemy spotlight. So if we want to light them a little bit differently, we can do that. And if maybe we want one area of the thing to be cooler or warmer lighting, we can change our light color and control some of that. Uh, there's a lens flare on this, and then there's some more lights that I might have been playing around with to create a specific effect. Um, something else is, oh, I was going to show the post processing. Yeah, so uh, I can see why you said that uh, if you had baked light, you have you would have lost a lot of control. Uh, you wouldn't yes. be able to do what you're doing now. Exactly. So mm. it's like to make the scenes to tailor them the way that I, I wanted for them to look, to have a very specific aesthetic. I mean, it gets a bit heavy. We did end up having to, to switch to deferred rendering from forward rendering, which has its own caveats in Unity to allow us to have more light sources. Um, and it caused issues with switching ported to platforms like the Switch. Uh, Xbox was fine. Um, in terms regards to post-processing, we have specific post-processing. So there's a slight amount of bloom. Uh, this vignette, some backgrounds have more color grading, ambient occlusion. So just to create a little bit even more shadow around the bottoms of grass and things um, and color grading, just unifying the scene a little bit. So you can see some of these backgrounds is more apparent what the post-processing is doing and some of them it's not, but it just creates that kind of unity that unifies the scene at the end. Mm -hmm. Um, Damien is asking, uh, does your sprite use the default Unity lead shader? Uh, the material. I'll look at the material in yeah. a second. Um, pretty sure they do use the basic shader. We did have to, this is the problem, I don't know with whatever project that you're using, but um, shaders get to be a huge issue when you're porting to other platforms, like PlayStation always wants you to change your shader library. So it's mm -hmm. like, uh, Let's see if we can find the example of that. But I think we are using the default lit. But when we switch to different builds of the game, different builds. Uh, so if we're going to switch or whatnot, we had to change the materials because the the default shader in Unity is fairly heavy. It's heavier than if you you do a shader that is exactly what you need. Uh, let's see. Just pull on there. Um, so on our base characters, let's see. 
click on the image. It's hard to I can look into the material a little bit. Mm. Let's see. I mean, all of the things are using, I think, the same material. So same material. Sprite's default material in Unity. So I think it is based off of the like our just for our viewing and stuff, it's based on the the standard Unity shader. Um, yeah, you have basic. Mm. This is a kind of odd thing because I was using initially I was using uh, metalness and smoothness to adjust reflectiveness of different assets, and then it broke halfway through, and I had to go through every asset in the entire game and readjust their position, readjust their the asset for it to to stand out. Mm. Um, any other questions? Or you, uh, you, you told us that uh, this scene was really hard to do. Oh, or... yeah. Yeah. Huge pain in the butt. Well, these scenes, especially, I actually had the scene working in 2D beforehand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not this version of it, because this is the one I made later, but the Naroche one. I think it's Naroche. Um, Naroche yeah, it's this one. So this is the base scene. So if I switch to the scene view here, you can kind of see. So you have this like thing and you need to have all of these layers kind of scroll at the appropriate time. And then it ends in another scene. So if you go all the way up to the top, there's, you see, you see this background broke the game. And there's also this giant oh. monster that I drew that shows up <laughs> part way through. So I had to create this interesting level of parallax as it goes up. Um, Anyways, it's it's utter hey. shenanigans. And then there's a little room somewhere. Where's the other room? Right when you get to the top, uh, top room. So let's take a look at the top room. So floating up there, it has to end in this little scene and change lighting as it gets there. So the whole level starts moving at certain points in time. So initially, I was doing it with Photoshop. Um, sorry, not Photoshop. With uh, at the af the offset, and I had to time everything manually in two dimensions <laughs> to end up at the right place and work the way that it did. So it was just essentially like a visual sea of timing nonsense was mm. what it was and just to make it look right. So it was like, I literally would do it and I would take a calculator and I'd be like, oh, it needs to be exactly this amount of time or it needs to be this. And if I if a frame is this long and I add it to this, then how do I do that, right? It's kind of like, it gets to be a little bit funny trying to recreate, um, an intended asset. So I, I mean, the train and the the elevator were the biggest pains in the butt for mm. things like that. Some of them are like, uh, where's the the factory? Should be. Dungeon factory. The factory one here. Factory. This one's kind of fun. Um, but you know, just using offset animations on a tiled texture to give the illusion of um, movement, movement hmm. grouping, grouping some assets. Uh, you can see there's a giant robot thing that comes in the background here and starts just looking at you while you go. Anyway, it's just like, silly kind of oh yeah for this one i think it's light at one point like uh, yes yeah this light. so i i use two volumetric lights and then mm. i kind of move them around to to sweep over the players so it has a sweep where it goes like this and then back and then but they're they're on a time thing so it doesn't always do the same sweep because it'll turn on at different points in the sweep of the light but i thought it was just kind of a fun creepy factory um yeah I don't know. I mean, this is, it's kind of weird looking at it now that I'm distant from it because this is like three years of my life, right? Just doing mm -hmm. assets for this game day in and day out and, um, you know, to be done and to look at it again is kind of interesting. Most of the, I have like, we have a foreground group you can see for the assets here and they disappear once you go to interstitial view, they'll turn off. So they don't get in the way of the camera when um, the camera does things during attacks. So we had to kind of set parameters and stuff for them to behave that way. Hmm. Yeah. Well, Damien is telling you, thank you for showing all the secret beyond, beyond uh, Star Renegade. And I must agree, like, uh, I, I didn't expect all this, uh, uh, all this information you gave us and it was really fascinating. 
Um, Thank you. We we have arrived to the end of uh, our time together, and uh, I was wondering if there is anything you wanted to add or to say to the audience. Um, yeah, I guess you know, just keep making art and see what comes of it. I think that like the more people are trying to do amazing things with games and art, the better everything will be. So yeah, I don't know. I thank you for listening to me. Hopefully, there had some bit of uh, information that was useful to you. And uh, I hope you know something was inspiring you. And if you make any work that inspired you based on this or anything, please show me. I'd love to see it. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Great. Well, thank you very much for everything you told us. It was really a, a, a blast, if I can say. Um, yeah. And uh, everyone, it was our last conference. So maybe, so people, please come back tomorrow. And well, again, thank you very much for everything, Ryan. It was really a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, yeah, you so, as well. Thank you. Well, everyone, goodbye. See you, uh, see you tomorrow. And goodbye, Brian. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.